Good morning, everybody. Well, welcome to another live uh, streaming event. We've been having some bugs this morning. Uh, we're still trying to get uh, Teresa online here, but uh, I had pineapple for breakfast, and that is the larger consciousness system's way of expressing love through fruit. So I'm in a good mood already <laughs> this morning at my coffee. Uh, Teresa will be getting to us. Uh, fascinating chat coming up when we get Teresa on a PhD in physics. So we, we're, we're physics deep uh, this morning, but I guess for now, what we'll go ahead and do is, uh, is do a little one-on-one -on -one with Tom. And, and occasionally when this happens, I just take advantage of the fact that I'm sitting in the host chair. So I kind of wanted to uh, approach Tom with a, a, a guess, a, a, more of an ask for you to expand on than, a, than really a question, but having been raised uh, as a Christian, um, but in a more progressive uh, Christian household, I was eventually you know, pulled out of the dogma that comes with the religion itself and what people who are even not Christian kind of refer to it as Christ energy, which is, you know, he sort of personified unconditional love, uh, especially defending the, you know, the unfortunate, the downtrodden, the meek shall inherit the earth, things like that. So um, it's still something that remains very deep to my core, which also then resonated with me when I heard that your outcome uh, through your studies in a completely different end of things came out to be essentially the same thing. So could you speak a little bit to that? Yes, it does come out to be essentially the same thing. Um, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I approached this from, from the angle of science, then from the angle of uh, consciousness studies, and then from my own experience within those consciousness studies. And that's how I got to, to my conclusions. And it was a very big surprise to me that um, going in, you know, particularly in the very beginning, I'm 20 something and a, and a physicist and think that, uh, you know, people who are religious uh, just, uh, you know, are, must, must have weak minds and not able to uh, think for themselves and so on. So I had this very negative attitude toward religion in general and religiosity. And then three or four years later, as I get deeper and deeper into this, I realized that uh, these religious folks actually got to the answer uh, long before I did, that basically most of the world's religions um, kind of, kind of uh, revolve around the idea of love, of caring, of um, ethics and morality, uh, helping those who can't help themselves. All of this is, is kind of fundamental to to uh, religion, and indeed, that is the goal of the of consciousness. That's how consciousness evolves. It's toward uh, cooperation and caring and compassion. Those are the those are the attributes of a highly evolved consciousness. So it does dovetail very nicely. Of course, in the in the my big toe theory, uh, the larger consciousness system is finite, imperfect. And there is no dogma. There's nothing one has to believe or whatever. Matter of fact, belief is the enemy. We try, we try not to uh, believe. Well, hello. I believe we have Teresa. <laughs> I believe Hi, we have so Teresa. sorry I was late. That was uh, quite a technical challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, we're glad glad to have you here. We were just kind of talking a little bit about, um, you know, I was raised Christian in the sort of what we define as the Christ energy minus the dogma and how it relates to uh, my big toe. So um, okay. perhaps, Tom, uh, you want to wrap up or shall I go ahead and introduce our new? Uh, go right ahead. Okay. Well, uh, Teresa, I watched your, uh, what was it, all reality uh talk last night uh, from, uh, I believe it was Southern California, and was quite uh struck in that, well, A, you have a PhD, I believe, from the University of Washington. Is that correct? That's correct. Go, yep. go dogs. Uh, I'm a Seattleite, <laughs> of, or used to be. Uh, but also a lot of what you've been tuning into has been very similar to what, you know, physicists like Tom have, have been tuning into. So uh, why don't you do me a favor and just kind of give us a, a little version about you and what you do? Yeah. So, um, you know, when I was in graduate school and getting my PhD, I found that, you know, I was thrown into this very left brain world of 80 hours of physics a week. And through that process, uh, after about a year or two of it, I found myself feeling imbalanced because of it. Prior to that point, I had all kinds of diversity and, and uh, well-roundedness. And then all of a sudden it was just physics. And in this 
uh, realization that I needed something else to bring that balance back into my life. I've brought all these different aspects of life back in, like creative hobbies and athletics and sports and um, social time. And, and the, the key piece that ended up being the thing to bring that sense of meaning and balance and purpose back for me was bringing in a spiritual element. And so from that point, I really started to dive into what brings, um, what can bridge the science and the spiritual without it being a religious approach, just more like understanding universal principles, both from the metaphysical and the physical and weaving the two together. And I found that that really um, ignited my, my passion and that that was really where I, I found my heart. And, um, and so then through that process, it led me into studying more the Western mystery school tradition. So ancient teachings of alchemy, which is where science originally was derived out of. Uh, but in that time, science and spiritual philosophy were, were already one. And then I also was exploring into sacred geometry and Kabbalah uh, from more of a universal context, not so much a religious context. And then this led me into the modern mystery school, which uh, has been uh, an ongoing journey and path for me of, of it really bringing together the metaphysical tools and ancient wisdom teachings from around the world and the tools that they give us for personal transformation. And I found my passion really in this work. And so um, I did finish the, the PhD work, but I also decided that I was going to rather than sticking with the traditional career of physics and going into academia or research, I really decided that I wanted to make an impact and a difference now and be able to really explore the, the realms of consciousness and, and bridging the science and spirituality rather than just doing traditional science. So uh, I have ventured off more into the metaphysical and being a teacher and I travel internationally teaching some of the the Kabbalistic and alchemical and other mystery school type uh, trainings and programs and uh, live in LA but travel all over the world offering some of these teachings and then I'm also continuing to evolve how do we bring that back together with the quantum physics and the science and see where these two realms meet and how we can find more of a, a consistent um, integration between them without it being one or the other, or without it being just um, philosophical or just theoretical, how can we really, you know, bring them together in a way that's practical? So that's, you know, in brief, a bit about it. And, and if, uh, for the audience, her website is uh, TeresaBurler.com. You can uh, get a bunch of information about her there. Now, Teresa, I found it interesting, you know, you were talking about alchemy and uh, about how, uh, you know, it's kind of like two oppos opposing forces and you try to bring them together. And sometimes that's not such a good thing. And sometimes it turns into being, well, you use the caterpillar example, which is, uh, you know, I think one of the better ones about how at some point, some of the cells within a caterpillar start to say, hey, I'm, I'm supposed to be a butterfly, but not all of them realize yeah. that and they, they, all hell breaks loose. But eventually you get to a butterfly. So we're kind of hoping we get to that point. So yeah, alchemy, I think we're seeing now science and spirituality being, well, I, I always say we're, we're trying to force them together, but to me, there's there's really no division. It's just in our minds there seems to be a separation. But uh, yeah, you, go ahead. You know, if I can, if I can add to that, I think that um, you know, alchemy is going through its own alchemy, or science and spirituality are going through their own alchemy. And at one point, they were together, and and then they separated. And you know, you had the the science and more of the religious uh, or spiritual aspects, and then. In, um, in that process, you know, science has really advanced a lot and perfected its scientific method and has, you know, had its own evolutions. And, um, and now we're kind of coming to that point where we're trying to re rejoin them, right? Have that conjunctionis again, and, or the conjunction where they come together in a harmonious way, um, but in their more purified or elevated form so that they can work together to bring a greater whole. So, you know, it's, it's all the alchemy of separating and recombining, and that's been happening with, with science and spirituality as well. Now, it's all part of the process. Uh, what, what we usually do uh, for everybody is we give our special guests a chance to ask the first question of Tom. So do you have anything you want to throw his way? I do. So I've been uh, exploring a bit into some of the models that are, have been proposed around the um, 
the, the physical universe and even consciousness that we perceive and uh, experience with our senses or our detectors and how this is actually maybe more of a holographic projection from a higher dimensional um, realm. And I'm wondering how some of the simulation uh, idea that you're wanting to test relates in, or if it relates in at all to the idea of a holographic universe or of uh, you know more multidimensional, like some of the string theories get into a lot of multidimensionality. Uh, so I'm wondering if there's any connection in there. And if so, what, um, you know, if there is a simulation that's been programmed somehow and we're experiencing it, how, like who programmed it and how, how does consciousness fit into all of this? So that, that's, it's a multi-part question, but. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I'll take the last part first. And that is that uh, in, in my um, uh, MBT, my big toe, consciousness is the computer. Okay, consciousness is fundamental, and everything else is derived from consciousness. So we have what I call the larger consciousness system, and that larger consciousness system uh, is the the source, if you will. That's what's fundamental. Okay, now this system is evolving. It's not a done system. It's not a complete system. It's it's in its own process of evolution, and it's evolving toward. Uh, caring toward uh, becoming love, that sort of thing, because that's the low entropy solution for a social system. And it is a social system because in its evolution, uh, it did like our biology did, it uh, broke itself into pieces. So it was a, a multi-celled thing rather than a single-celled thing, rather than one monolithic consciousness. It's a large number of individuated units of consciousness. And when you have a social system, then the optimal way that a social system can can uh, lower its entropy and that's what actually conscious evolution is about it's about lowering its entropy lowering entropy means more information consciousness is an information system so if all the bits are random there's no information as you order those bits you create information so entropy being um, you know more order that's also more information in an information system so the low entropy configuration of a social system is where all the members of the social system are working together, are caring, are cooperative, are uh, interested in, in each other rather just in self. So that's the direction that uh, this larger consciousness system is evolving in. And you and I and Scott and Vanessa and all our listeners are these individuated units of consciousness. So that's kind of where my model comes from. And uh, the reason for the virtual reality is that the way consciousness evolves and lowers its entropy is through its choices, by making choices. By its choices, it um, makes good choices, it evolves, makes poor choices, it de-evolves. And good choices are choices that lower entropy. And poor choices are choices that raise entropy. So we talk about the love side, that's where we're headed toward evolution. And the fear side, that's where we're headed toward de-evolution. Okay, now in order for consciousness to do this, it needs, it needs good, uh, good choices. It needs a set of meaningful choices with feedback, with consequences. And consciousness, just being an information system, was just talking among itself, you might think, like a big chat room. Well, there's not much traction there. There's very few consequences to a big chat room. So this virtual reality was not programmed but was allowed to evolve. You start with a rule set and a set of initial conditions, and then you hit the run button, and this reality starts to evolve. Of course, that rule set is what we call science. We dig out the rules. That's what science does, tries to understand the rules and the rule set. So that's why we have the virtual reality, is because the virtual reality then sets has a lot more rules in how things interact, where there are a lot more consequences. There's a lot more interesting uh, choices here. So this virtual reality then that we live in becomes an entropy reduction trainer for individuated units of consciousness, mm. sort of like the flight trainer, you see, that we come here and, and uh, come to a place where there are lots of very interesting and dramatic and life-changing choices that we get to make. So that's kind of the, the overall scheme of things. So in a way, it does connect to... Um, 
uh, the uh, you know the, the other ideas of this being uh, coming from a higher dimension, right? Well, consciousness is non-physical to the physical. You know, this vir virtual reality seemed to be physical from the avatar's viewpoint inside the virtual reality, but virtual realities have to be computed by something that's outside the virtual reality, and that has to be non-physical from the viewpoint of the virtual reality. And consciousness and this computer are in a communication with each other. That's how virtual realities work. The consciousness is the player of the avatar. So consciousness is non-physical. So yes, this comes from outside the physical world, which um, I think with a metaphor, we call that higher dimensions. Now, it's I, I don't use the metaphor that, um, you know, of the um, uh, holography. I don't use that metaphor. Uh, I understand how that metaphor works, and I see that we have something very similar between virtual reality and, and the holograph, and that is that the holograph has uh, every piece of it holds the, holds the DNA, if you will, for the whole. Mm -hmm. okay? You have any piece of a hologram contains all the information for the whole hologram. Well, in virtual reality, is, is very much like that, too. With this evolution of this virtual reality in, in evolved systems, uh, you have a fractal process. It's what I call a process fractal, where the output keeps feeding the input, which then produces new output, which then produces new input. And as you produce that fractal, fractals are the same way. And that is that every you know, chunk of the fractal holds the information of the whole fractal. So we have a lot of similarities like that, but I don't, uh, I don't see it as a holographic universe. I see it as a... Uh, as, a, not, as a, a virtual reality computed in consciousness by the larger consciousness system, and our virtual reality is evolved, not programmed. The initial conditions, of course, as, you, as I'm sure you guessed, was that small ball of plasma under very high temperature, very high pressure, and the rule set is, is all the rules about how things, you know, how that plasma might have changed when you hit the run button and the constraints are let go. So that's uh, what I call the big digital bang. And from that, we evolved this, uh, this virtual reality just evolved in, within the consciousness system. So that's kind of my, uh, my worldview in a, in, a, in a nutshell. Okay. There seems to be some similarities between the, some of the hermetic principles where it says, you know, the universe is mental. Everything is, is a, a mental thought or, or a projection that then gets experienced through correspondence as above so below and, and so forth does that um, yes. relate into it mm -hmm. yes okay. yes everything is consciousness everything is uh, is um, information mm -hmm. see it all consciousness boils down to information and um, it also of course being conscious it's also thought so it's uh, you know, those those two come together so in my world the fundamental thing is information you know, it's, it's interesting for anybody that's, you know, like me that kind of came more from, you know, either a religious or spiritual background that, um, you know, when I talk to people that have, I try to explain to them that, you know, we use the term virtual reality, which to some spiritual seekers, they, you know, that sounds awfully kind of cold and, you know, calculated and all that. But if you believe that there's a, you know, a higher realm, uh, you could call it a heaven or whatever else, then you're naturally making the assumption that this is not the base reality. So I don't really see that there's a disconnect you know, if you believe in a higher power and that there's something beyond this re this realm, this fits right into that that philosophy, right, Tom? Yes. Well, let's uh, let's head on off to our audience. I see we have a lot of the same great characters that continue to show up every day. Hello to everybody in the audience. I I see you chiming in there as we're going, and I love seeing the questions and comments about Vanessa's hair. They're they're <laughs> quite popular today. And and for the record, Vanessa and I did not agree on what we were going to dress like today, but uh, it just kind of worked out the way it did. I was really, really I was going to wear what Teresa's wearing, so thank God I at least went for the, the blue shirt. But anyway, let's go off to uh, Vanessa and let's, let's get some questions rolling here. Okay, so the first question that came in is from George Tudikan. And he says, Tom, can you explain virtual reality to someone who is not into computers or high-tech civilization, like someone in a third world country? 
I suspect it would be very difficult if they uh, have never uh, you know, had a computer, never seen a computer, never played a virtual reality game. It may be difficult, but I think I would just start with the idea that it is a, that it is a calculated, a computed reality. And maybe if they're third world, they wouldn't really know what computed meant either. So then you would be back to saying it's just about information, that it's a reality that is constructed out of information. And uh, that would be about as far as you could go. You know, the, that's that's the reason I think that, um, you know, when uh, when the founding fathers of quantum mechanics back in the very early 1900s were struggling uh, and struggling, coming up with their uh, Copenhagen interpretation, actually one interpretation then, but the Copenhagen uh, explanation of uh, the results of, of uh, their experiments. Uh, they really had a hard time trying to figure out, you know, what, how could you look at this? From what perspective could you look at this and have it make sense? Because it didn't seem to make sense in any of the standard materialistic ways. Well, they didn't have virtual reality as a concept, just like someone in a third world country right now, you know, Einstein and Bohr and Heisenberg couldn't look at this and say, oh, it's all about information. They knew that it was about information. They knew that was key. But to put that in a construct of a, of a bigger picture that then makes sense, that idea didn't actually start to occur to anybody. A, you know, virtual reality might exist, a computed reality, until you know the gamers started to point in that direction. And we could see that, yes, indeed, all right, give us you know, a, a computer that's a million times better than the ones we have now. And Virtual reality could be a you know a very credible and believable uh, uh, you know experience. So now it's not so hard to see. But yes, if you don't have a computer, you don't think in terms of computation. It's just very difficult to have that idea. I think if we had had virtual reality games back in the uh, late 1800s, we probably would have you know gone to a virtual reality concept when we started to see that that reality is information based. That would have been a natural uh, transition. But as it is, uh, it's uh, just becoming a thing now in the last decade. A decade ago, there was still almost nobody that thought virtual reality was a good idea in physics. But now, not so. A lot of physicists think it's a good idea. So that's a, that's a lot of movement in just 10 years. I expect the next 10 years is going to move even farther in that direction. The idea that this is an information-based reality. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I, I, I worked at Xbox for a little brief time and I was, you know, one of those kids that was raised on Pong and things like that. And, and I think it was Castle Wolfenstein that was like the first uh, first player game type thing. And then we progressed into things like, you know, uh, World of Warcraft, like you're talking about Halo. I would have never thought all those quarters that I was pumping into the machines was one day going to lead to our uh, <laughs> understanding of reality. But it certainly <laughs> makes sense that, you know, in such a short time, I mean, you know, in 30 years, we've gone from, you know, a few little things that can hit a ball back and forth to, you know, being able to roam in photorealism in inside reality. So it's it's our understanding of it. It really seems like it's just sort of in the uh, infancy at this point. And I did notice yes. as we're going, uh, several people chimed in. I think uh, if you're going to explain this to a third world person, you might uh, tell them that it's a dream because we've we've spoken in that that sense that that might make sense to them. Yeah, that's uh, and you know a lot of indigenous cultures kind of had that conclusion that uh, we were living a dream, and when you die in this reality, you wake up out of the dream, and that this reality is a dream. Well, 2,400 years ago, Buddha called this reality an illusion, you see, which is, you know, might sound like a virtual reality or a dream, either one. So people for for you know millennia have had this concept, but it's only been recently that we could put it into a, a very neat little package called virtual reality. That's kind of a new concept. All right, Vanessa, what else have we got from the audience today? Okay, so Victoria is saying, um, how do you address the individual who, whose default position on anything that can be described as metaphysical or spiritual is to be so suspect that even conversing about these things may be considered ridiculous beyond measure? What is a good question to help expand the curiosity of these well, I would like to toss that over to Teresa because she's probably dealt with that just about as much as I've dealt with that. Maybe I've been dealing <laughs> with it a little longer than she has, but no doubt 
that's part of her life as well. So you've probably heard me talk about this before, but let's see what Teresa has to say about that. You know, my, my uh, experience has been that if somebody is so rooted in a materialistic worldview and they're, they're attached to that being the, the only possible explanation, they don't want to be open or convinced otherwise. And so no matter how much I have found you know, trying to present to them alternative ideas and, and disengage them, that if they're closed, they're closed. And so then it's just a matter of, well, you know, why don't you just uh, keep your mind open to possibilities because science is about questioning and then finding experimental ways to verify. And, you know, science has not yet verified that consciousness is only an epiphenomenon, even though that's the favored model by the material. You know, they say consciousness is just about your brain and, you know, emergence of neuron patterns firing in the brain, but that's just a model. They haven't proven it. And, um, and yet, you know, you have the observer effect, which is very well known effect by now with the double slit experiment and, and so forth in quantum physics. And so somehow our observation, our participation is really important in the, you know, what, what results out of that quantum field. And so there are things that point to it. And, but I just find that trying to argue with people who are, you know, stuck on a materialist view isn't really, it's not really going to get you very far. So just, you know, yeah. I don't know what, what have you experienced, Tom? You, <laughs> you presented. Well, I, very yes. Bad. I, I, um, I come to the same conclusion, probably the, the, the least, uh, effective thing that you can do in life is to argue with somebody who, what I call a true believer. You know, if somebody really is wrapped up in their beliefs, and whether that's a scientist wrapped up in the belief of materialism, or whether that's somebody who's religious wrapped up in the belief of whatever, uh, it doesn't matter. If you run into a true believer, arguing with them is uh, is just not profitable. It uh, leaves both of you exhausted and feeling worse than before you started. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a thing just to let go. Yeah, you can't go there. People will not, will not grow up. They won't see a bigger picture until they're ready to see that bigger picture. And if they're not ready, there's absolutely nothing you can do, nothing you can say to make them ready. That's a place they have to get to. And you know, uh, Teresa started this, this, our conversation with talking about feeling out of balance. And you know, if people think about their own lives, they'll realize that they have, you know, there's two, two parts to their life. There's the objective part, and that's the part that science studies. And then there's the subjective part, and that's the part that's inside their own heads. That's their own assessment of reality. Well, if they think about it, they will find that the subjective part is where all the things that really matter are. That's where the love is. That's where the caring is. That's where the relationship is. That's where all the stuff that, that matters resides in that subjective part. The objective part, well, that's just the stuff. That's the props. You know, that's the, that's the props on the stage. Well, okay, props on the stage are important. We need a stage and we need props. But all the action, all the players, that's all subjective. And that's the balance that she was talking about. If you, if you are in this... Uh, left brain world and all you do is logical processing you begin to feel kind of empty and you be begin to feel sort of hollow inside it's not a good place to be out of balance all in the objective world it's also not a good to be out of balance all in the subjective world you can get out of balance in that world as well but this you know if we if we think about striking a balance um, we also have to think that the subjective world is where most of the meaning and significance is. And the objective world is just the props and things that we have to deal with. So uh, when you think about that balance, uh, it's not really that these are two kind of equal things of equal importance. They're not. The subjective world is really more important than that objective world. It's a more significant, more important place. So when you're out of balance, as far as uh, all, your, all your mind all your time is spent in the objective world, you're really out of balance. And uh, when you talk to somebody like that, there's no way that you're going to convince them of anything other than what they already believe. So the best thing to do is smile at them, give them a hug, 
wish them a good day and uh, you know make a make it a friendly relationship rather than one that's confrontational. You need to pick your you need to pick your times for having arguments, and that's not a good pick. Can I can I add one more Absolutely. thing? Sure. So I found that um, a lot of scientists that I've met who started off uh, more atheistic or or in that material worldview only who have then switched into finding their way towards realizing that actually consciousness is primary is is the only solution to um, both the physics and the subjective and typically most uh, stories that they share has that they were they were very atheistic or materialistic but then they had a personal experience that forced them to change their mind and it wasn't some somebody else trying to convince them or tell them otherwise. They had a personal experience that was like they couldn't deny it, whether it was the death of a loved one and then really experiencing that person's consciousness and presence around them afterwards, or whether, you know, like there's a story of um, how uh, Wolfgang Pauli, who was one of the, you know, main, main players in the quantum physics revolution, how he went and switch because he actually had a bit of a breakdown, like a like a you know a psychological breakdown because he was so focused on just the objective and and the intellectual, and then it started causing a lot of problems in the emotional and subjective realm. And then he ended up seeking out the help of Carl Jung, who then introduced him to the whole idea of the dream world and active imagination and and you know, I Ching and Taoism and so forth. And then, you know, he followed that and it continued to become a very rich experience for him. Uh, so uh, if that, yeah, it's all choppy. Is he like, oh. have, their, have their own awakening. Oh, sorry. I, at least I caught, I caught, I didn't catch the, the end part there. You locked up on me, at least. I don't know about everybody else. Everything locked up. What, at what point did I lock up or did everything freeze? Just the last 30 yeah. seconds. Oh, just that um, if people, you know, if we're going to have a conversation with somebody, it's like they have to just have, I have found that you have to just back off and, and let trust that higher consciousness is sending them the signals or the information in their timing in their path and that they'll have their experience that might open them up to that realm uh when it's time for them and until then the door is closed and it's like you can't really get in but once that door cracks open and because they've had their own direct experience that causes them to start questioning their perception and their belief system then when that door starts opening there's a chance to have and, and open the door a little further. You know, just for, I, I'd like to actually, uh, Vanessa, I'm curious, you know, how do you deal with people when they're, you know, not wanting to hear what you have to say? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm hearing an echo now, but, oh, now it's gone. Okay, it was just me. Uh, how do I deal with people if they're not open to hearing this? I, I really won't associate with them or they won't be drawn into our community. Um, and actually, you know, half the people in our community, they're not, they're not, um, they're not into MBT per se, but they are into being good people. You know, like they, we all share this common kind of uh, purpose that we want to grow into, become really compassionate, loving, kind people. And maybe science is the way for them, maybe the spirituality or meditation, but it's not about having to all agree on the same thing. It's about ag agreeing to disagree and at least share one common goal, which is to evolve into our full potential of being a loving being. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what I think. What's best for us is just helping <laughs> each other and meet each other where we're at. Well done. Yeah. Okay. That's, a, that's good. That's good, Vanessa. The, that, uh, it, the wanting to become a better person, wanting to grow up to be good people, that's the key. And there's probably a thousand different ways that you can work in different uh, organizations and different uh, uh, schemes and theories and so on that will take you in that direction. But going in that direction is really what's important. The way you get there isn't, you know, isn't really very important. That is the key thing. It's the growing up and becoming love, becoming more compassionate, becoming more understanding and caring. And if you're doing that, 
it matters little how you get there, whether it's through a traditional religious path or whether it's through something else. You know, it makes no difference as long as you're progressing down that path. That's really the important thing. Yeah, and like you've often said, Tom, your model is basically, they're metaphors, right? They're metaphors for us that, that resonate with some people and other people, they resonate with different metaphors. But find what works for you and yeah. as long as you're growing, right. you're gonna love them. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I thought of uh, yesterday, I forgot to bring this up, uh, Tom, you'd mentioned something about, you know, that you never really stop working um, in your growth. And, and I believe it's a, a, an old Zen proverb about a young man that wanted to go climb the mountain to become in, enlightened. And as he was going up the path, he saw this much wiser, older man coming down with a big backpack. And, and uh, obviously this was an enlightened being. And so he walked up to the man and said, you know, what, what is it like upon enlightenment? And without saying a word, the old man took off his backpack and set it down on the ground and the young man was like, oh, that's so, such a gorgeous metaphor. And, and so what's it like after enlightenment? And the old man picked up the backpack, put it back on his back and continued <laughs> on down the, down the path. And I thought, boy, if that's not one of the best exactly. metaphors for how it plays out. Yeah. We never stop yeah. learning. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Should we hit up another uh, audience question here, Vanessa? Yeah. So Rich is saying, um, um, Robert Monroe once said that the graduates of Earth School are very highly regarded in the universe. Because this graduation, I suppose, involves lowering entropy to a very great degree. Do you concur with Robert Monroe's statement? And can you shed any light upon the role of such a graduation? Well, we don't really graduate so much as we just, you know, we, we evolve. And as we evolve, we get a bigger picture. As we get a bigger picture, we live in a larger reality. And all of that is just part of our evolution. So. I guess education's like that too. Yes, you graduate from kindergarten to the first grade, to the second grade, to the third grade, and every grade is a graduation, but basically it's really a continuous stream of growing and learning and, and being able to see bigger pictures. And that's the way, you know, that's the way this is as well. And yes, this uh, particular virtual reality that we call our physical universe is one that is, uh, you know, it's a really good virtual reality. I've been to maybe five or six other virtual realities that are physical like this, and they, you know, they're similar in ways, but um, I like this one. I think this is a very good one. And uh, it's because we have a nice balance here, actually. There's a lot of challenge. There's a lot of challenge, but it is, uh, I think, one of the most productive virtual realities uh, inside the consciousness system. So, uh, yes, we do have a, a very good uh, opportunity here to grow up. There's lots of opportunities to grow up. And you might wonder about that because if you look at the news, it looks like we haven't done a very good job. Everything looks pretty bleak out there, but that's opportunity to grow up. And um, it's a really uh, valuable place to be. Is in this is in this reality as hard as it seems for many people as much pain as there can be here that pain is mostly self-created and uh, once you begin to grow up some that pain turns more into joy than pain so it's just you know just keep keep working on it we're we're got it down to about the last 20 minutes i want to uh, keep grabbing audience questions i want to encourage anybody who's out there if you've got a question for teresa by all means uh, chime in and we'll uh, we'll throw a couple zingers her way as well um, some quick housekeeping notes. At last check, we were at about 186K, which at this pace will put us around 200, which would be great. I mean, we're, we're just grateful that we've hit the minimum. But as I said before, I uh, would love to, if, if we could get a couple more of those 10K backers and, and hit 250, I will not shave my head, but I will uh, definitely <laughs> pass on my undying gratitude for uh, while we're doing this. I mean, we know it's going to happen now. So anything you put in is going to actually have concrete effect on what we're doing and be able to help us do it better and do it more extensively. So in, in my mind, this is just, you know, this is really the, the golden time to get involved. So if you can, uh, you know, if you're not already a backer, become one now, tell your friends about it. And uh, let's roll on out to another audience question, Vanessa. Okay, so a question from Annette. I know Annette has asked this a couple times and I haven't had a chance to get to it. Many of you have asked some questions that I haven't had a chance to get to. You can always follow up on the Fireside Chat, which is once a month. And I know Cheryl is here, she's in the chat, and just connect with Cheryl. Cheryl will give you the details of how to, how to get on that. Uh, but Annette is asking here, Dear Tom, what is in the meaning 
of people with multiple personalities. They are changing their behavior, gesture, facial expressions, speech, voice, handwriting, etc. in a few minutes. Even their health conditions do so. For example, having allergy or diabetes, then it disappears in a few minutes again. Do these different, does this different information come from multiple individuated units of consciousness? Well, that doesn't have that um, phenomena, which is a rare phenomena, but it, of course it does exist. It, it doesn't have just one reason. You know, There can be multiple reasons why somebody ends up like that. It can be partially a uh, rule set, biology. It can be uh, psychological, and it also can be from the spiritual dimension. It can be from all, all three of those. And in most cases, it's probably a little bit of each. You know, we have to have a biology that encourages it and a psychology that encourages it. And then perhaps you can have multiple, uh, uh, multiple entities sharing a body. That's a possibility, extremely rare. Um, it can happen. Um, usually it's by consent. It's not a forced thing. It's typically, uh, I know uh, of some people who, uh, have loved ones living with them, if you will, in their body. It's uh, unusual, but that does happen. Um, I don't know what to say about that. It, um, it's an interesting phenomenon to study, but if you, if you uh, understand that this is just information, then you can see more easily how it can come about. You have a data stream that has information in it defining personality number one, and then you just change the information, which defines personality number two. So as far as the, the mechanism to create it, it's just changing the data in the data stream. Uh, why would these things happen? I would, you know, I really don't know. They just do. But if you look at, a, if, if you look at seven and a half billion of us, and all the variation that you can get in an informational system, in a computed system, there's bound to be some very interesting and very strange things happen out under the tail of those probability curves. It may be out at the five or ten sigma level. That means it, it may be very, very uh, unusual, but unusual things happen all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. All right, so uh, Peter is asking, uh, in the MBT theory, do some of the light, does some of the life creep occur before the IUOC enters a new avatar? For example, are soulmates a real phenomenon in MBT? Well, it's a possibility. It doesn't happen very often, um, but it is a possibility. Two people can decide to have a joint. Uh, experience packet, if you will, where they come here and their plan is to meet and connect. Um, unless the system is part of that plan, it probably doesn't work because once you get here, there are so many choices. And for the two of you just to end up meeting takes a little bit of nudging from the system. So if it's just your own personal plan, it has a very low probability of working. But if it's, um, if it's a plan that you've that you've got the system in on, then you can be nudged into such a situation. Um, you know, my own my own experience would would validate that. You know, I was aware of of uh, my wife Pamela uh, when she was two years old, and I was fourteen is when I was first told about her, and uh, uh, that was a very that was a very uh, a sad you know idea that the person that you're really going to be with is only two years old, but uh, particularly when you're 14 and full of hormones, that is just not what you want to hear. But in any case, it did work out that way and the number of children we would have and their sex of those children and what they would look like and so on, all of that was very accurate. And a lot of that was just nudged. So it was meant to be that way. Now, if you want to call that a twin flame or not, that's just a, a metaphor that people put on these relationships that seem to be uh, kind of destined to happen. Um, I don't give a lot of credence in, you know, twin flame, you know, theology or whatever it is. Uh, but uh, yes, those things do happen occasionally. People are sometimes meant for each other. But in general, 
you know, you have probably 50 or 100 people that you interact with. And out of those 50 or 100 people you interact with, you will probably pick one of those as your mate. And uh, it's a matter of um, uh, it's a matter of luck, just exactly who that turns out to be for the most part. Sometimes not. Sometimes it's it's planned. Mm -hmm. A lot of those plans don't work out because people don't make the choices that they need to make to to bump into each other. You know, so the, those plans sometimes go astray as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the twin flame concept is one IUOC splitting into two separate avatars, and then those avatars are destined to be together. Uh, probably not much. Now, I sometimes you will have one IUOC that will have more than one incarnation to interact with each other, but very rarely is that a romantic relationship. Mm -hmm. Mainly, mainly that is um, some some juxtaposition that is very important to their growth. It could be a romantic relationship, but typically the ones I've known, it's been uh, where there was a very, very difficult, say, uh, father and son relationship, where there was a lot of, of angst and dysfunction in it. Those roles will reverse and you will have the same being be both the father and the son so they get to see you know, both sides of the issue at one time. It'll help heal that it'll help heal that problem. Um, so those kinds of things will happen where you need a very specific piece of experience in order to get over, you know, something that's been difficult for you to learn, to grow up. So yes, um, sometimes you will have that, but mostly it's not to uh, come together in a romantic relationship. Mm -hmm. Although romantic relationships, of course, are those things that often uh, help us grow up because that significant other is the one that can that can jerk on your ego better than anybody else on the planet. Mm -hmm. That's just the nature of that role. The people closest to us are the ones that, that know how to push our buttons, whether they do it intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, that's where your vulnerability and that's where your ego is most likely to, to kind of roar up and show itself is in those most significant relationships. So, um, a relationship that didn't have any of that probably wouldn't be as growing a relationship as one that required some growth and, and struggle and changing yourself in order to, in order to, uh, you know, evolve in, within that relationship. That's probably more productive than one where everything is just, you know, peachy keen, you know, from the beginning to end, and there's never any challenge or never any stress. Yeah, that may sound wonderful to us, but it's probably not the optimal for growing up. And this, uh, this uh, entropy reduction trainer is about growing up. So that's why I say that probably doesn't happen a whole lot. Yeah, there's, may there's, I add to that? Yeah, thank you. Some people are asking, Teresa, what's your take on soulmates? Yeah, that, well, similar that, it, you know, if we were going with this idea that we're here to learn uh, and that we're in a you know simulation or an experience that offers us lots of learning opportunities to find that most ordered or low entropy state, um, any, any interactions and relationships that we have here in this experience are going to be for learning opportunities. So most people's idealized, romanticized, um, you know, hopefulness of, of the soulmate that's going to be perfect and everything's going to, you know, just be, you know, we're meant to be together and, and all of this. I think it is way to idealize, especially in today's society. Most soulmate, if there really is that sort of strong attraction energy at a spiritual level, um, and at a chemistry level and so forth, most of those types of what we might call soulmate uh, relationships are usually major learning experience relationships. They, they sometimes are the most challenging relationships. And so, um, you know, this idea that, you know, we're going to find the one and it's everything's going to be perfect and happily ever after, I think is, is a myth um, that we're here to learn, we're here to grow and that, that, but you can find those relationships that offer deep love and deep, um, support and deep lifelong learning, but you got to be willing to work through the tough points, you know, where, where you grind up against each other and where the alchemy happens from the, you know, the tension of those oppositions and so forth. And so, and, but you can have that with, with many people, um, you know, there's not just one soulmate or one twin flame. It's like, we have many, many people along the way that we're supposed to meet and have these, in, you know, learning experiences with. So that's that was, my, that was, you know, yeah. I, 
I, I have yet to, you know, in, engage with a, a, a romantic soulmate uh, on this plane, but I can speak to uh, something that was even going through my mind before I, I started studying Tom's stuff. But, you know, every member of my immediate family, especially my mom and I have a very, very close uh, spiritual bond, but my brother and I are very tight. I've had the same best friend for 40 years. And I started really looking at it and thinking, you know, it almost seems like we potentially as a, as a collective sort of agreed that we, Hey, let's meet up, you know, let's, let's meet up here. We have past experience because for whatever reason, you know, I met this guy in third grade that I didn't know anything about. And next thing we knew we were hanging out every single day and we've been best friends for 40 years. So you can't really explain that kind of a connection by, you know, doing mathematics. <laughs> it's coming from a different realm. So uh, Vanessa, what else have we got? Uh, well, Michael Carlson is just asking in which respective areas of this field are each of us, the four broadcasters, considered experts or highly knowledgeable? When it comes to relationships, I think anybody can have their take on relationships through experience. Uh, what I love about Tom is I've witnessed his relationship with Sam, his wife, the one, and it's actually the most evolved relationship that I've ever been able to be in the presence of. Um, because you do make it about other, you do make it about each other, and there's no, it's not a needs-based relationship, it's a love-based relationship. Tom, maybe you can talk about the book that you've been working on, um, The Primordial Man and Primordial Woman. Well, I don't know we have all the time for that, Vanessa, that's a long talk. <laughs> But I uh, will comment on what you just said. You said that Pamela and I seem to be a very evolved couple. But I will also tell you that Pamela is my toughest teacher. She is, she is the one that, you know, knows how to challenge me in ways that nobody else could possibly do. So that's, that is the way you grow up. You know, that is how you, you, uh, you evolve is through those, those relationships that demand that you grow up. You know, that's, that's the only choice you have. It's, uh, you know, it's dysfunction or grow up. And that is a really good relationship where the two people give that to each other and they grow up. And then you end up with a really magnificent relationship that, that evolves out of that. But it's not like that, that challenge is only in the first part or the first half or the first third. That challenge I have found never ends. It's a continuous challenge all the time. So uh, I always uh, credit uh, Pamela as being my, my um, hardest teacher. And she continues to be that, mm -hmm. which is good. That's exactly what I need. That's, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, uh, I'm very um, lucky to have such a, a hard teacher because you, if the lessons that you have are very easy, you don't learn very much. The lessons you have are very difficult, then you learn a whole lot more. Better to have difficult lessons and learn a lot than have very easy lessons and, and uh, learn little. It's not about having a good time here. It's about, it's about growing up. And growing up takes some work. Actually, the one one area I, I don't know that I'm necessarily disagreeing on this with you, Tom, but in, that might kind of put a different spin on it is, you know, my like growing up, my father was, uh, you know, certainly a, a very good, good man, but was, you know, rather rigid in his uh, in, in his belief system. And we, you know, me not being that way, we butted heads on several occasions, but, you know, loved each other dearly. But at the same time, I had a mother who was, you know, like I could literally just sort of fall back emotionally, spiritually, and I always had a place to land. You know, like I, I rarely have had any difficulty in my relationship with my mother, but the uh, it's probably the the lesson that I've learned the most about unconditional love towards anyone. Because my mom not only unconditionally loves me, but you know she would take a bullet for Tom, and she's never even met him. You know, she's that kind of person. So, uh, you know, in that relationship, I've had very little you know confrontation, but uh, there, I've learned so much about what it's like to have someone or something that you know that has your back, no matter no matter what you do. So it's a soft yeah, but, I, but I would say you did learn a lot from your father Absolutely. as well, even if even if it was you know what not right. to be. <laughs> what a, what a great learning situation where you have somebody telling you how to be and another one telling you know giving you an example of what not to be. Yep. That uh, that really you know both of those gave you uh, gave you learning. Just one was very pleasant and nice and warm and cuddly and fuzzy, and the other one was sharp and prickly. But both were very educational. Yeah, and they both came from a source of love, which is you know ultimately what it's all about. So, yeah. 
All right, what's our next question? We're getting short on time here. Yeah, it looks like the last question will be from Peter. Peter is saying, is there an end point to this virtual reality? Does the point of such low entropy love exist that there is no more opportunity <laughs> for growth for the IUSCs and the LCS decides to turn off this year? Uh, no, that's not going to happen. Uh, this is all about entropy reduction, and you never get the zero entropy. You just keep working on it. And if you ever get to the point that you say, I'm done, so I don't need to work, put any more energy into it, that's when you begin to de-evolve and things fall apart. That's just the nature of entropy. If you don't keep putting energy in, it starts to degrade. It starts to fall apart. You know, everything is like that. You don't put maintenance uh, effort into your home, your home will fall apart. And growing up is the same way. So there is, there is no end for two reasons. One is that, is that you always have to stay plugged in and, and uh, working and putting that energy in, otherwise you will de-evolve. The second thing is that what you're evolving to become is love. Love is not about self, it's about other. If it's about other, then you always have a job to do. There's always people that can use your help. There's always somebody in need. There's always someone that you can be a good example for. So you never run out of things to do if you are highly evolved and it's about other. So no, I don't think we ever get to, a, to an end point. Even if this virtual reality was just full of people, very, very low entropy, there's other virtual realities. There's, you know, there's, there's other universes, if you will. There's more and more to do. So there always will be something for you to work on to help be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. So no, we'd never get to the point that we're done. It's, uh, you know, work, work, work all the time, all day, all night. You know, that's, that's our life. Uh, Teresa, can you give us uh, some final thoughts? Well, just, yeah, we're, we're never so good that we can't get better. It's, it is an ever evolving process. And if, you know, if, if we, if our true self, our true consciousness is, is in that higher state, it's eternal, um, there is no beginning, there is no end. It's just this ever evolving process. There might've been a beginning to this physical universe experience or this simulation, so to speak, but, um, but consciousness is eternal. And so, you know, that process of ever evolving and, and, pushing, you know, the boundaries or expanding that self-awareness uh, is going to continue on, on and on and on and on. So it, it does become about the journey and the experience. I think in, in human terms, we get so caught up in um, how hard it is here and how uh, e much easier it would be if we just, you know, could, could go to that next phase. But as Tom has been saying, this is a great place to learn. And grow and and it's a very accelerated place to learn and grow so you know we're here to to really uh make the most of each moment and and do the best that we can and you know find our way towards that more loving uh enlightened state but enlightenment you know a lot of people think these days that enlightenment is is the goal but enlightenment as your story was sharing is just kind of it's a marker along the journey and it's a point of yeah. awakening. It's not the end. It's the beginning, really, to where we step into a more awakened mm -hmm. state and really realize that we're here to serve and that the work continues and that it's an ongoing process of, of uh, you know, living from that higher awareness, not getting dragged back down into the ego sort of attachments and so forth. So, yeah. Well, thanks, Teresa. Yeah, if you uh, want to find out more about Teresa, you can go to TeresaBullard.com. Uh, just another quick reminder. Tomorrow we have uh, Nancy Mc. Now, how how do I pronounce her last name correctly? McMonagall. McMonagall? Is that correct? Okay. McMonagall. Yes. McMonagall. All right. Yes. Executive director of the Monroe Institute. So another fascinating chat. I believe that's at uh, noon tomorrow. And then Thursday, uh, if it goes as it looks, it will be our last live stream. And it will be mano a mano with Tom Campbell once again. We'll be going, uh, just taking questions and getting through as many of them as we can. So we're getting down to the last little bit, about a week left. Let's see if we can hit that 250 mark. So maybe Tom will shave his head. I'm not saying he's going to. I'm just saying it's possible. But, 
Join us tomorrow at noon. Thanks again to Teresa for joining us, to uh, Vanessa for uh, interfacing with the audience. Thank you to the audience. You guys, we wouldn't even be here. We wouldn't be continuing this mission without you guys. And of course, as always, big thanks to, to Tom for his, his wisdom and uh, information here. So we want to bid you all adieu and thank you for joining us. We will be posting this on YouTube afterwards so you can share it with your friends. So thanks, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, guys. Good luck. Thank you, Teresa. Bye. Thanks, Teresa. Thank you.